please, Shell, take the stage. Thank you. It's always nice to be Norwegian and Swedish during the Skiing World Championships. <laughs> is, the, is the male relay team in goal yet? They finished? Yeah? <laughs> oh, I'll try to be nice. Uh, I just want to start off by saying this is not a, a, a talk to slag down Scrum or Kanban because I don't know much about that. Uh, so this, uh, the title is just to emphasize this is not about Scrum and Kanban. Uh, so if you have any sharp knives or guns, just put them away. I know this is Malmö. It's easy for you to <laughs> go that way. Uh, when <laughs> I, uh, Martin didn't tell me who the other guys were when I, when I said yes to this. So when I saw the, the lineup with the impressive people, I had to, <laughs> had to Google myself to find out who I was. Um, I think some of you might have seen me before because I was here during uh, uh, Competence Bio talking about the Fission's team, with me and James Bond. Anyone was there? It's going to be an exact copy of that, so you can just leave. No, it's not. Uh, you know a little bit about the other guys, but I can tell you a little bit about myself. I've been working in IT since 1996. It's really long. It doesn't seem like, it like that, but I, I you spent my first few years as a consultant, and then I moved away from that into selling consultants, kind of like a pimp. Um, and and <laughs> this comes out wrong. Uh, I really enjoyed pimping. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> but for some many reasons, I ended up in Microsoft for five years and, and worked for Bill Gates. Uh, but after five years, I was kind of tired of filling the richest man's, man in the world's pockets with more money. Uh, so, so after five years, I just had to do something else, and I started up the .NET department of, of uh, WebStep in Oslo, and spent 10 years doing that. So uh, a few of my old colleagues are still here, but they're not working in a WebStep either. So after 10 years, I, I decided I, I was a bit fed up of uh, how all companies worked. There's a lot of people working, and then there's a few people owning and, and accumulating all the value and, and get, getting rich. Uh, and, I, and I wanted to do something else. Uh, I'm not here to, to advertise for Boitano, but I'm here to advertise two minutes about the idea and maybe inspire a few of you to, to do like the guys in Living It. Uh, a few weeks ago, these numbers came out saying that anyone recognize them? It's not mathematically correct, by the way. <laughs> I see some of you are computing now. This is not right. No. And it is not right. But the number says that the 26 richest people in the world owns more than the poorest half of the population in the world. So 26 people own more than 3.8 billion people. And that's not right. Um, and this is in the world, in, even in Norway, which is a very equal country, 70%, uh, no, no, sorry, 10% of the richest own 70% of the equity. So even in an equal country like Norway, this is really bad. And it's not very good for, for capitalism either. In in US now, even people in the middle class have to work two jobs to make ends meet. And, and there's something wrong. We have to do something about it. And and I'm not very into to revolutions. Because uh, now we live in a knowledge society, we don't have to do that. Because uh, the biggest companies now, they're, they're worth nothing if we don't come to work. It's our heads that is the value. So if we just choose not to work for these guys, but work for ourselves, uh, I think we could slowly do something about it. So when we started Boitano, this was basically the idea. You, you, you can do this without doing it as complicated as we have done, because we have actually started two companies. One is uh, consultancy where everyone is equal partners, everyone is equal owners, uh, and uh, and we do much like living it. We are developers, a few UX people, and a, a few counselors. Uh, and what we do is that we we take all our profits and invest it into our investment company. And we do that in, in that company. We we help startups uh, get going, both with money and our own competence. And that is why being agile means so much for us, because we are going from selling one-on-one -on -one consultant out to a customer 
where the customer decides what we build, the customer makes the business case. Uh, now we have to do that ourselves, and it's, it's to be honest, we don't know what we're doing. Uh, so, so we have to use our, our own collective intelligence and knowledge uh, as good as we can to make this succeed. I have to time it, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, when, when I spent my five years in Microsoft, I, I didn't work in development at all. Uh, so when I came back, uh, there was a new expression I never heard called Agile, uh, and I never heard of Scrum. And one of my first reference call, when we, we tried to hire this talented young uh, woman, uh, I called one of her colleagues and he said, you know, we do stand-ups every morning, 20 minutes. And I said, wow, this sounds like a lot of fun, how, but how do you get up with new material every day? Uh, <laughs> And, and uh, I had a colleague listening in, and he actually fell off his chair laughing. <laughs> uh, this is 12 years ago, and he still mentioned it. So, so for me, Agile was something completely unknown. So, uh, but I saw how our customers were doing it, and I was kind of in doubt, because for me, Agile means something, but what they were doing wasn't very Agile. So I, I had to look it up to see if, if I had misunderstood. But the word Agile means adaptable. It means quick. Uh, and that is what I felt Agile was. But a lot of companies trying to be Agile didn't do this. They, they made a very rigid system instead. Uh, being Agile is actually what has brought us all here. Uh, it's the evolution of the species. It's not the strongest that will survive. Uh, it's the most adaptable to change, which makes me very happy because I'm built like a beanbag. So I'm kind of shapeable. Uh, but, but this, is, this is like the foundation of our species. Uh, so it's a good thing, I think. Uh, I'd like to start by talking a little bit about, about the Agile uh, Manifesto and what, that's, what it says, because I, I think we tend to just forget that when we, when we try to get Agile in our company. It's four points, very fast. Uh, the first point says individuals and interactions over processes and tools. The other point says working software over comprehensive documentation. Uh, and, I th and I like the word working valuable uh, software, not only that it works. Uh, the third point is customer collaboration over contract negotiations. And the fourth is responding to change over following a plan. Does anyone feel that when they are trying to get their companies agile, they do this? Or do you do something else? You all do this? No, okay, because that's the, that, I think that's a bit of a kind of like the problem, because when uh, the first problem is this, this is uh, very often an initiative from development and developers, uh, and, and not from management as it should be, because being adaptable to change is a business thing, it's not a development thing. So it, this should be running through the whole company, but it's usually uh, a thing coming from the developers. And because we tend to not f focus on the interactions and, and individuals, we do the opposite. We, we put in some processes and tools and a lot of uh, language and expressions that the business side, it, it alienates them. So when you come to them talking about being agile and you, you dump scrum on them, uh, I, I think a lot of them get scared and they think, okay, let, let the development side do this and we do whatever we have always been doing. So I, I think we scare them off. Uh, and we also, as the developers, I think we, when, we, when we see the point two uh, working software, we think, okay, no bugs. We'll make no bugs, then it's working software. Uh, and when we see over, doc, uh, over uh, uh, comprehensive documentation, we, we, we tend to think, okay, we don't need any documentation at all. And the business side, they, they tend to like documentation. The other, on, the other thing that I've, I've seen in my own company as well is that responding to change over following a plan, it doesn't mean that we don't need a plan. It, it means that we can change the plan. We don't follow the plan through when new information arrives. So I, I think it's a, a lot of things that we do that, um, that makes it difficult uh, to, to get agile into the company. Uh, and the stupid thing is that being Agile, working uh, with Agile in the company, is actually a very good business plan. 
So, so we, we need to get the, the business side to realize this, the management to realize that this is a smart way to do things. Uh, some of them like research, and I think you do as well. There's a lot of research on the subject of, of uh, how to work efficiently together. And, and most of it really supports Agile. Uh, I think many of you might have read a study from Google, uh, their internal study on how they uh, see that some teams are efficient while others aren't. Anyone read that? Yeah. This is basically a study that, that says the same, but it's since very few companies are Google is basically only one, uh, this study is from a, a vast array of, of businesses. Uh, MIT has a human dynamics laboratory and they wanted to find out why some, some teams consistently deliver better than other teams when they seemingly are the same. It's from the outside, it's very difficult to see why uh, one team should be better than the other. So they, they started to study this. So what they did, they, they included 2,000 people. It's a huge study, uh, ranging from hospitals to banks to call centers, a vast array of, of industries. And they equipped them with these electronic badges that records how much you're talking, uh, how much energy you put into it, how much you use your body language, who you're talking to, if you're facing them, and stuff like that. Um, so, so over a vast time, they, they measured all of this. And what I found is that if you put all the other factors they considered into the equation, uh, the in uh, individual intelligence, uh, the personality of the people there, uh, the skill set they had, and even the substance of what they were talking about. If you put all of those together, it's as important as how they communicated. Uh, and that's a very interesting find. They got what's four points they put in. They, they said, what we found is the most efficient teams, everyone was speaking in uh, equal measures. Uh, it was not like two or three in the team speaking a lot and the others don't speaking. But they were fairly equal measures. Uh, and they were speaking with a lot of energy, facing each other, uh, looking each other in the eyes when they were talking, uh, and connecting while talking. Uh, and they also saw that they, they didn't go to the boss, and the boss went to the other guy, they were talking to each other. Uh, the, the manager was managing, he wasn't bossing around. So that's very, very important that the, the members uh, connect uh, directly with one another. And they did what you did today. They went outside the team to find new information. Outside the team to other teams in the company. They went to classes, they went to some of them, maybe beauty and code, maybe not. But that was what they did. And that's where they, they brought inspiration back to the team and made the team, team adapt. So I, I think this is a good study to, to to show that uh, being Agile actually works. Or how I understand Agile. <laughs> I'd like to say, <laughs> say a few words about size as well. Because uh, the size of the team really matters. Uh, and, and I think people that don't, don't know too much about development, they think if you put on one more developer, you will get one more outcome. But we, we all know that it's, it's not that way. So it seems like the ideal uh, size of a team for f basically any team, but also for developers, is, is, a, is around six. If you add more than six, uh, the output will go down. So it's, it's try to keep it small. And the, the reason behind this is, is uh, this is not new. Uh, this Ringelmann guy is a, it's a German. I think this is maybe 200 years old. They you found out this, 100, 200. He says that uh, when you add people to a group, the individual uh, effort goes down and, and the need you have to coordinate goes up. And you see that in IT projects. When, when the project grows and you depend on other teams, the, uh, some people, they spend their whole days in meeting. They don't do anything. They just, just coordinate. That's all they do. So it's, it's basically a waste of time. Coordination does nothing positive for you. So this is another study, is my last study, I promise, uh, from quantitative software management, where they, they uh, have a huge database of, of projects, and they looked at around 500 of them over a three-year period, uh, and then they compared, they took one simple metric, uh, 100,000 li lines of code, 
uh, and then they said, okay, we'll look at teams from f five and down and 20 and up and see how productive they were. And as you could see, adding at least 15 people made them deliver a few weeks sooner, two to three weeks sooner. They went from uh, the, the big teams with 20 or more had uh, delivered in 8.92 calendar months, but the small teams, they were a bit slower, 9.12. So you can deliver faster with five times more people. The problem is the cost. So if you look at the cost here, it's, it's uh, 1.8 million dollars on average compared to 245. So dumping a lot of people on your project is probably not a very good idea if you're concerned about the cost. And we're all, you're all developers, you know that if, if you put five people in a room coding 100,000 lines of code and 20, I would guess the five will get much more out of that, those 100,000 lines of code than the 20. So probably the number is even worse than this. Okay, let's get back to Agile. Um, the first, they talk about individuals and interactions, and I think it's a very, very good way to start. And for me, that is all about people and how they relate to, to one another. I've always been very uh, concerned uh, about taking account of, of the whole person, uh, not only the, what the peop person knows and uh, what they've learned in school, because uh, I, I found out that the whole person is the, is the one that actually comes to work every morning. It brings with him his history, his family, his friends, his concerns, or her, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so, so if you want to, to get to know the person you're working with, you, you have to, to take into account the whole person. Uh, when we have interviews in Boitano, this is where we start. We start off by talking about ourselves from 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, a little bit about work and education, but mostly personal stuff. Uh, and then uh, the candidate does the same. It's not, we don't force them to do anything, but it's kind of interesting because we always see people learning things about themselves by telling their story. And, and some of the people I've been doing this with, my colleagues, I've been working with them for six, seven years, and there's always something new. It's quite fascinating, actually. But for us, it's, it's important because that's where we start to build those relations. And the people working with us, they, they can get work anywhere, basically. So we have to, to give them a reason to want to come to us, and building that relation is the first reason we, we give them. And, and what we've seen is when people feel uh, safe and trusted uh, and secure and, and know they can trust the other people, they, that's when they do their best work, basically. Uh, and also what I've seen is, I, I have one of my colleagues, he's been working as a... As, uh, independent consultant for 20 years before he started working with us. And his problem was that he has a wife working shifts. He's got three children in a wide array of age, actually. Uh, so, so it was problematic for him to, to get to work to nine o'clock. And the places he worked, they, they wouldn't allow him to come in later. But once he told us, this is my problem. I, I have to be independent because I'm not going to be able to be here at nine o'clock. Okay, let's start the meetings at 9.30 then. It's no problem, we know that he works, uh, but he just can't be there in the morning. So knowing that about him made things very easy for him, uh, easy for us to adapt to his needs as well. Uh, and I think you will see that in many places, that knowing uh, things from outside work will, will make it uh, easier for you to, to, uh, to make an efficient team, because you can adapt to different people. <coughs> you, you can't do this all the time. You can't go around telling your story to your colleagues five, six times a year. So I, th I think you, you can, of course, uh, but don't. <laughs> but, but what we have done up, up, uh, up and through the times is to try to make it fun. Uh, we try to have quizzes where all the questions is about your colleagues. Uh, we have uh, done our own adaption of, have you seen on BBC, uh, Would I Lie to You? You'll find it on YouTube. Uh, watch Kevin Bridges explain how he accidentally bought a horse. So it's brilliant. But we, we've done that, so we've, we've collected history stories from everyone, and it's not the boring stories. You have to, yeah, like the one, uh, the, the one girl that said she, she's been uh, accidentally uh, checked up by, uh, uh, what's his name, the karate guy? Oh, I forgot his name. Forget it. 
Steven Segal, yes, thank you. It's a great story. Uh, but what we've seen is that people discover new things about each other, and, and it's, it was, has been one of the, f the few funniest nights we've had when we've been doing that. Uh, and, and you can see people, two friends, finding out they've both been riding equestrians. They've known each other for years, and they, they haven't known that you used to ride a horse as well in competition. That's quite funny. So you, I will urge you to, to try to to make team building activities but, activities, but you don't carry a log around in the woods. If, if that's what you do for a living, please hurl around that log. But if you don't do that, try to make team building activities where you get to know each other better. Uh, relational skills is, of course, the fundamental of, of, of uh, getting to know people. And it's, I get a little bit sick of this because people say, oh, it's easy for you because that's, that's how you are, but, but it's not who I am. When I was a child, I, I was very happy sitting by myself reading books and, and doing stuff that I was interested in. Uh, friends were something I, I, when I had the need, I went out to meet. Uh, so I, I'm not a very extrovert person, really. I, I enjoy my time alone. So this is something I've had to learn. For me, small talk, was very difficult. I couldn't understand why you should do it. And I still don't do small talk. I try to do big talk. So when I talk to people, I talk about things that I think matter to them and I'm interested in hearing. And that's when you get all the interesting stories out. So relational skills is something you can work on. I think it's healthy to know what a relation is. And it's a lot of relations goes in steps. And I'd like to to tell you that not all relations are very healthy. You have dangerous uh, uh, relations uh, that can actually be dangerous to your health, uh, leading to high blood pressure, heart attacks, depressions. Uh, and those close relations, uh, th those relations that tend to be close. It might be your mom and dad, your brother, sister, wife, husband, uh, might be even your children. Uh, it might be your boss. It might be the whole place you're working in. Uh, and you can't stay in dangerous uh, relations for too long because uh, it will damage your health in some way. So my advice is, if you can't do anything about it, get away from it. Uh, I've, I'm happy to see that uh, a few people that listen to me talk has actually done that. The, uh, you have some relations that are not dangerous, but you'll find them. Uh, the relations that are just ex exhausting, people that annoy you, People you probably people you work with that comes up with some idea or some opinion and you don't listen to them because this person is annoying. I just want you to go away. And if you're not thinking, uh, no, no, I don't have anyone like that in my team, then it's it's probably you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just so you know. But you want if you want to work efficiently together, you you will have to realize that it being annoyed at that person is a choice you make. Uh, and if you want to be a nice person, you have to respect people. So even though that person is annoying, try to listen to what she or he has to say. And, and try to, to lift that uh, relation up to a level of respect where you actually listen to what they say, build on their ideas and stuff like that. Uh, so in, in your team, everyone should at least be at a place where they respect each other. The, the best thing is to get up to a level where you're friendly and friends but it's, it's, it's something that will happen when you build relations. Uh, I saw that when I left WebStep and most of my colleagues decided to, to follow. Not because of me, but because they were a bunch and they wanted to con continue to be their own little tribe. Uh, as I said, love at work, it's, it's not, uh, I won't discourage it, but one at a time. Uh, yeah, it can get really complicated. I'm a, I'm a big fan of something called relational management. Uh, and it's basically just uh, having a positive view on other human beings, where you, by getting to know them and showing interest in who they are and what they know and what they want to do, you find out what they're good at, what are their skills, uh, and you find out what are they motivated to do. What do they like to do and what don't they like to do? That's very important. And, and that's the basis of relational management. Because you try to cultivate the positive, you try to get people to do what they're good at and what they're motivated at doing, and then you try to 
to tone down the negative side, the things they're not good at and they're not motivated at doing. So whenever I've been building the teams around me, that's been a credo. Uh, we, we know that, okay, we, we need to fill a position. That person has to, to be able to do these things and be motivated to do, thing, do these things. And that's what we do. Uh, one of my best salespeople, when we hired him, I think everyone else would have hired two to three other of the, the other guys we were interviewing, because they were working in, in uh, big companies on the stock exchange, very impressive uh, CVs, but they couldn't do what we wanted uh, from this person. So that's why we chose him. He didn't, didn't know anything about IT back five, six years ago. He still don't know anything <laughs> about IT, by the way. He's not here, he can't argue. And you won't tell him all you will, you know? No, no. Because <coughs> when you put together a team, it's, it's kind of a puzzle. Where you, when you know people and you know what they can do and what they're motivated at doing, you put together a team that knows all the things you need to know to get this project flying. And that's not just technology, it's, it's business, it's operations. You, you need to include that in the team, maybe not 100%, but at least 20 and make sure that they, they, they have a proximity to you, so it's easy to go over to the desk and ask questions. It's, it's very important. And also, uh, when you build up that team, try to get personalities. That's not all the same. You can't have all these revolutionary guys going, oh, we have to change all the company, because you, you need uh, the, the, the people that wants to keep things as they are as well and find some middle ground. Uh, so, so be aware of that, don't, don't, don't have, fill the team with, with the, the same personalities. Uh, a very fairly important part of what we do is to make working valuable software. And it's, for me, that's a, it's, uh, it's, it's important to emphasize it's, it's not working software without bugs. Because working software without bugs might not solve the, pro uh, solution, uh, the, the problem at all but a bug-ridden solution might actually do. So, so make sure that you make the right software. And for me, that comes from how we communicate with each other, and not only as developers, but also with the business side of the company, and how we transfer knowledge from us to them and from them to us. Uh, this comes down to, to a few things. Communication comes, one, from how you talk to other people. Uh, this is very simple. <laughs> uh, but I've, I've, I'm uh, not a big fan of, of watching politics on TV because they are in the debate. It's not very intelligent. They don't even answer the questions. They, they just hammer their own opinions, their own message. And it's, it's not a very good way of communicating. I think the, the most common way of speaking to each other is the discussion where I have my opinion, you have your opinion, and one of us is going to win. Uh, I think it's the most common. Uh, but it, it's it's also not very intelligent. I think the most intelligent way is when we have a dialogue. When you say something, and I'm not just waiting to say my piece, I am waiting to comment on what you've been saying, building on what you've been saying. That's when you have a dialogue. So make sure that you, the next time you, you're in a meeting that you're not discussing, try to have a dialogue instead. It takes some practice. The other way is how we listen. Uh, and I used to say it's, it's two ways of listening. Uh, one is what I call engineering, how engineering, uh, engineers listen. It's correctional. And the problem is that you have to have that on at some point. At some point, you are going to make logic out of this mess. Uh, and you have to have that listening on, that, that way of listening on. Uh, the problem is you, you don't have to have it on straight away. Uh, when you start a conversation with someone, don't, don't do this. Try to, to listen to their intention, especially when they're not developers. Because uh, they will just find it's a hard time talking to you. So try to, to understand what they're saying, what they're meaning. Don't, don't try to make logic of it uh, straight away. So you, you have to, to be able to, to listen to the attention more often than we, than we do, uh, do the same. Because the thing here is to, is to create a good dialogue between you and the other people that is there to solve the problem. And uh, then you have to, to turn on your, what I call the active listening. 
because you, you both listen to what they say and think about what they say at the same time. So you can ask the intelligent question, you can follow up with your own ID, building on their ID. Uh, and, and some of the best companies in the world, they do this. Uh, I will urge you to read the book Creativity Inc. Uh, about Pixar, uh, where, where you can see some of the ideas that have turned into movies. These terrible ideas. It doesn't even sound like the movie. But because they always build on the ideas, they tend to take another direction and turn into a genius idea instead. And that can happen all the time. Uh, and I also, you need to be aware of that you know science, and, and you, I mean, you know computers and coding and, uh, and, and technology. Uh, but some of the guys you're talking to, they don't know that. They know the business. And you might un not understand the business, and they not, don't understand the technology. And you need to get each other to understand. You, you need to, to put on your educational mind and try to explain the possibilities of the technology to them in a way that they understand. And that takes a lot of practice. Uh, I've seen some of the best technologists. I know that they're not able to understand to business people why we do this. And you, you really should. So that's something uh, we need to work on. Uh, and in the discussions, what I like to do when I start off a, a meeting is to get everyone involved. So you always do a trip around the table talking about something because then everyone is on. Everyone has been saying something at the end of the, at the start of the meeting. And, and I always see that it's easier to get everyone involved uh, after that in the conversation. It's a small, small little trick. Uh, and also, if, if you like me are very talkative, I think it's a good idea to lean back and and think, okay, I don't have to say this now, I can wait, and let others do the thinking as well, others do the speaking as well, because uh, it tends, the most talkative people tends to, to kill the engagement. So I, I always wait and see if someone else has come up with my idea. If they don't, I say, I say it eventually. But it's, it's not important for me that I'm the one who comes up with that idea. And of course, uh, how you kill a dialogue, I think we've all been there, being sarcastic, interrupting people, making jokes, correcting uh, their uh, grammar. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not a very good way to have an engaged dialogue. What I urge people to do is, is try to find a structured way of, of discussing things. Uh, because what tends to happen is that uh, someone comes to the business side to discuss an idea, and, uh, and, and you start to solve it straight away. It, it's, it's not because then you find all the flaws. So, so what I think is good is to, is to try to find a way to work with ideas uh, uh, one step at a time. So you know that, okay, I can be that negative guy, but I have to wait two hours to be that negative guy. So now I have to be the positive one. You know you'll get there. You know that's, that's going to be a part of the discussion, but it's not straight away. So what I like to do is, and what we are doing right now in Boitano is, people are coming to us with ideas. And first you try to understand what is this idea and why, why do we need to solve this? And there's always a bunch of assumptions behind an idea. People will need this. Uh, I don't know how they built Snapchat because I don't know why people need it, but <laughs> they succeeded. Uh, but but there's, there's a lot of assumptions there and, and we need to, to get all those on board first. And then we go uh, go to the next step and try to find out, okay, what do we know and what do we need to know? Uh, and, and is there some way to test all these assumptions? Uh, I, I, most of you have been on Kickstarter, I guess. Yeah, that, that's a, a, a fairly new way of testing assumptions. I, I think a lot of the, the, the big companies now, they are testing their ideas on Kickstarter first. So Bose recently uh, came up with these uh, airplugs that you have put in at night to help you sleep. And that is an idea they actually put on Kickstarter and, 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 found, and used Kickstarter to find out, is there a market for this? Uh, I've I read about these uh, girls in California coming up with these uh, earphones uh, where you had the uh, cat ears on the top with speakers. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea. No, they, they went to a lot of investors and they'd say, no, no, we've, we've spent all our money on cat ear headphones this year, so we're not going to, to do that. So what they did, they put it up on Indiegogo, and in, in, in a few weeks' time, they got $3 million in, because there's crazy cat ladies all over the world. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and I've actually, even in my home place in, in, uh, in Oslo, I've seen those earphones. It's a cool story. Uh, and when you know all the facts, or as many as you can get to know, you start brainstorming. What can we make? What can we get out of this? And during the brainstorming phase, you don't want negativity. You just want to, to, to look at the opportunities. But when you've done, then you can let in the pessimist. Then you can rip this apart. Then you can talk about all the things that can go wrong. Uh, and when, you, when you've done all this and you decide, okay, it's, it's about time we start making this, then you start making the solution. Then you turn on your... Uh, uh, your co corrective listening and, and, uh, and become a programmer. But I think it's, it's important to, to have the programmers with you. Uh, my colleague down there, he just talked about maybe the word programmer is wrong because you're more of a problem solver. And if, you, if people look at you as programmers, they tend to include you in the green part. But with all your knowledge, you should be a part of the whole discussion. So maybe a programmer is not a very good word. When it comes to customer collaboration, I've, for me, that's all about involving the customer, if, if it's a real customer or, it's a, or it's a, if it's an internal customer, getting them involved and getting them engaged. That's when you, you have a nice customer collaboration. Uh, a problem in, in a lot of development uh, projects is that you, 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 you don't have that engagement. You don't have people across the company in the project, for some strange reason, they, they think that you will make this better without them. I, I don't know why, but it's in many cases very difficult to, to get the business people involved in telling you what they need. A lot of cases. I don't know why it is like that. Uh, I mean, it, and it's also it's, it's vital but difficult to, to get top level manage, get management to get involved as well, because a lot of projects has a, has, a, has a huge implication on how the business is run. So if you want to do this, in the best possible way, you very often have to have support from the top management. And if, and if you don't have any lines of communication up there, it's, it's going to be difficult to, to make really, really good software. Uh, I, I don't have a, a, a recipe of how you can do this. Uh, and I think in a lot of companies, it might take a long time. Uh, we've had several customers that don't say, no, we, we're not IT companies. We, we work with, uh, what's in Castle in English? Yes, debt collection. Uh, and we say, yeah, okay, but 97% of all your revenue runs through your IT systems. You, you're not a, a credit collector, it is the 300 people is working with the 3% that is not going through the systems. Well, you're right, but we're not an IT company. Now to, nowadays, most companies are IT companies and they need to realize, but it's hard for us to do anything about it. But what can you do? I think you will always know that there's, there's a business side to a lot of projects uh, you do. And, and you need to, to get a buy-in from those people. You need to get them engaged. And a good way to start is, of course, building those relations uh, and building them all along. Maybe you know that maybe we're not going to do this project now, but I'm going to sit next to you at lunch, uh, having a coffee, talking to you, building those relations. Because when you have those relations, it's so much harder to say no when you come calling and say, I need you on my project. Uh, and I also think it's important to force the users into a room very early on in the projects to find out what they need, how they work, what improvements you can put into this, because otherwise you're, you're just going to make a, a new version of the old system, which I think a lot of us has done many a time. So you need to get them in. Uh, and what I think is a good idea is that in, in many, many times when you have a workshop in a project, uh, the workshop leader has some kind of role in that project. It might be from the business side, it might be from one of the departments, it might be uh, one of the developers or the, or the project manager. Uh, and, and very often that person has some kind of stake uh, in the project. And, and I think people have a tendency to think that, uh, that you have, uh, have, a, have an agenda. So, so uh, to get a neutral workshop leader, I think, might be a good idea. And what also is nice about that is, is the guy who used to, or the girl who used to be the workshop leader, can now be a part of the meeting. Because that person usually has a lot of competence. So I, I will urge you to think about that. 
And when you get that buy-in, you get them into the room, you, you start to working, start working together. You find out what you need to build, then you visualize, make some mock-ups, make some uh, some um, uh, you don't program everything. You, you, there's a lot of tools you can use to do this. Uh, and, and don't email the, the, what you've come up with. Sit in front of them, show them, talk to them, find out what they mean, and gather the feedback. And when you get the feedback, both then and, and later on in the project, you can use that feedback to create even more engagement. Because if you manage to make a short feedback loop from the, or a short loop from the feedback, to when you show them the results, you will show them that your engagement leads to something. If it takes half a year from they say, oh, I want that button over there, and after six months it's there, it's not very responsive. So if, you, if you're good at sh uh, responding to the, the requests of change and show them that this is, we've actually done this now, you will manage to, to get them more involved. The last point, is responding to change. Uh, and of course, responding to change is, is vital in, in, in Agile. Uh, and you, you can do that by evaluating what you do and trying to improve that. I think what we often do is that we, we try to evaluate things as a team. But uh, if, you, if you want rapid change, you have to, to do that to each other as well. Give each other feedback. When you do something good, you do something bad. And do that personal feedback. As one of my most difficult uh, times as a manager is if, when someone comes to me and says, that guy did something wrong. Yeah, okay, so I, I'm not supposed to use your feedback. Go to that guy, talk to him, and he will give me some other feedback, and I will have to go back to you. You have to talk to each other. Uh, and, and that's... That's not easy, but uh, I found this FBI uh, feedback formula that I really, really like that uh, you can use. Uh, what I like about it, you have another one which is bigger that, that's called SBI. But in that theory, I, what I don't like about it is that you assume that you're right. In the FBI, you don't assume that you're right. Because you, uh, you start off with, by, this is how this made me feel. And uh, you, you can't say no to that. Because you can't, oh, you were not angry. Uh, uh, yes, I fucking was. Because it's your feeling. But you're not seeing that your feeling is saying that your feeling is right. Uh, so after emphasizing your feelings, tell the person this is the behavior that made me feel this way. And this is how it's, it impacts me or how I think it impacts the project or whatever I'm doing. I have a few examples here. Uh, you can just, you just read them. But for me, it's, it's a good way. The, 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 what I like about it is that, okay, it's, it's fairly direct, but it's, it's, uh, it's, I, I think it's oftentimes, if you do it right, the, the other person won't try to shoot back at you, because I think it will respond to the feeling, and you will have, uh, have a nice conversation, maybe not a nice one, but you will have a conversation about it, not just, you did that, no, I didn't, you're stupid, no, you are stupid. I think this is a good way of, of of getting to talk about the real problem and, and how people uh, behave. So this is, for me, this is, uh, is very important in, in evaluating and, and moving a team forward. Uh, I think we, we've all done retrospectives. Is that right? I, I don't like the word retrospective because it looks a bit backwards. Uh, and, and, uh, and they say hindsight is 2020, but, it, but it's really not hindsight. It's, it's, rose-colored very often. So what I like to do is, is reflect not only about what, what, what's past, but also what's coming. Uh, so so uh, I got this, it's not my uh, wording, it's from a colleague, they said, uh, call it reflection workshop, workshops. But when you do it, be, be completely honest. Uh, criticize yourself first. That's a good way of being honest, but don't be shy of criticizing others. Uh, and try to find never more than three, maybe not more than one thing you can improve until next time. Because this is not how many improvements can we find. That I've, I've seen so many times people come up with 20 improvements. Yeah, yeah, but you're not going to do any of them. But if you have one, it's so much easier to come back next time and say, okay, why are we still doing this? We need to improve. So, so prioritize what you improve. I will also, and, and go through with it, don't just talk about it and forget it. Actually improve. 
I would urge you to, to, because most projects have a steering committee higher up in the organization, I will urge you to, to bring them along to those meetings, because a lot of the improvements you need to do is outside the team. So if, if, you, uh, if you need some kind of competence or, or you, you need a bigger project room or you need another project, something, uh, probably not something you can do about directly, but they can. So bring them along to the meetings. Make them, because uh, they are a vital part of the project after all. Uh, also, I think that I see, seldom see projects do is to evaluate the metrics. To, to show how, how is what we make perceived? Is it, do we have users on it? Uh, how much time do they spend using it? Is it like they go into it and ah, we don't want to use this and leave? Uh, have we, do we have any revenue on it? Do we need to make adjustments? Because the development team is a vital part of getting the software used. So, so I, I will urge you to, to start using uh, some metrics that matter uh, that you can, uh, you can evaluate if you've succeeded with your project. Uh, and also, especially in longer projects, uh, the people you need will vary. So to sit down uh, regularly to see, do we have the right team? Do we need some competence that we don't have? Is there someone we, do we have too much competence of this that can be used somewhere else? Uh, I think we need to do that fairly often to make sure that the team we have is the right team to solve this. Just to end this off, perfect timing, huh? <laughs> then this off, uh, the heart of Agile is not an expression, it's a company. Uh, anyone heard about Alistair Coburn? It's very particular to, to not call, it, call him Cockburn, as it's spelled. But he, he started, uh, it sounds like a disease, he started, uh, along with, uh, he was one of the, the brains behind the Agile Manifesto, and he has started this consultant company called The Heart of, of Agile. And he says, Agile is fairly easy, you can break it down to four points, collaborate, deliver, reflect, and improve. And two of those points are reflecting and improving. So I urge you to, to do things simpler and, and not run to Scrum straight away. Uh, Scrum can give you so much good, but for me, Scrum and Kanban is step two, three, four, maybe. Not step one, as it, it usually is. If you want to, this is my contact info. I'll stay here for the most of the day. So uh, if you have any questions, please just ask. Thank you.